I greet you once again in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a joy to be with you yet another Tuesday evening as together we study 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. This evening our study will be taken from chapter 3 and again it is a very short chapter with a very simple outline. And the outline would be first of all we would see where the Apostle Paul sent them a helper and then secondly, he wrote them a letter. And thirdly and finally, he prayed for them. So very simple outline this evening. So let's worship. And God's a good God, yes he is. Our God's a good God, yes he is. Thank God he's a good God, yes he is. My God's a good dog, yes he is. Oh, he picked me up, oh yes he did, and he turned me around. And he planted my feet on solid ground. Oh, he picked me up, oh yes he did, and he turned me around. And he planted my feet on solid ground. And what a mighty God we saw. What a mighty God we saw. The angel bow before him and heaven and earth and talk him. What a mighty God we serve. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angel bow before him and heaven and earth and talk him. What a mighty God we serve. He never failed me, yet he never failed me. My Jesus never failed me yet And everywhere I go I want the world to know My Jesus never failed me yet He never failed me yet He never failed me yet My Jesus never failed me yet And everywhere I go I want the world to know My Jesus never Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always be you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else. Mother, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you. Jesus, who? Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else. Mother, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you. Jesus, oh, 
from my heart to the heaven. Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heaven. Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Jesus be the center of our church. Jesus be the center of our church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing From my heart to the heaven, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heaven, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about Jesus, be the center of my life. Yes, Lord. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always be in you, Jesus. Jesus. So let's bow our hearts for prayer this evening. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence yet another evening. We thank you for each person on the platform. We thank you for helping us week after week as together we study the books of First and Second Thessalonians. We pray your blessing upon this study this evening. We invite your Holy Spirit's presence without whose help we will not be able to do it. And so we pray that you will help me as I share. And all those listeners out there, we pray that the Holy Spirit will help them to understand and that the word of God will be simple, would be clear, and most importantly, we would learn and we would grow through it. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we go. First Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm going to pick up, let's just pick up in the first section, verses 1 to 5. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now, as we look at chapter 3, what we would recognize is that the Apostle Paul is very systematic in his presentation. As we looked at chapters 1 and 2, we realized he was talking about the foundation of the church. He was talking about nurturing them. But now he's coming to yet another stage in their maturity. And so in this chapter, he is encouraging them to stand. You know, it's like... Um, 
the parent with the baby, remember when he spoke about him as being um, like a nurse, you know, like a nursing mother and how close he is to them. But, you know, there comes a point where as parents, we have to take the children, you know, away from the breast and they're going to have to start to grow and they're going to have to start to develop. And one of the first things we do with them from a, a physical standpoint is that we hold their hands and we try to get them to stand. And the intention is that day by day by day, their limbs will get strengthened. And before we know it, they'll be standing. And it's only a matter of time. One day, unaware, we say, wow, the baby's walking. And so this is what is happening here. The Apostle Paul is, is coming in, as we will say, like ice cream with this church, starting right at the beginning and taking them to this stage. So as we come here to chapter three, he is now encouraging them no more to be breastfed, but now to stand and to stand strong. So let's just look at the verses. As a matter of fact, let me just bring out for you as well the key word that uh, gives us the sense of that standing is the word establish in this chapter. Verse 2 reads, And he sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith. So we're going to talk a little bit later as to when he did send Timothy to strengthen them, to help them to stand up despite the persecution, to establish them. And then look again in verse 13. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. So the desire is that they would stand strong, but they would not stand strong only for a time, but even as they would come to the end, they will be established and rooted and grounded and unblameable in Christ. And so that established brings out the picture of standing. If we look at the key verse, it is found in verse 8 and it reads for now we live if we stand fast in the lord now we live if we stand fast in the lord so let's bear in mind as we are doing this chapter that he is strengthening these babes and bringing them to the place where they can stand and it's only a matter of time that he's going to talk about walk. All right. So let's look here now as the first three verses. And his emphasis here would basically be on the helper that he had sent to them in the person of Timotheus, known more comfortably to us as Timothy. So here we are going to see, I want to read some scriptures because from Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul moves to Berea. And when they went on to Berea, troublemakers from Thessalonica also went behind them in Berea. And so they followed them and they had opposition even there. But what is good, you will remember, we did read when they went to Berea, the people there were so open, they were ardent students of the word, and they examined the scriptures, and so they believed in what the Apostle Paul had to say. And so from there on, he left for Athens. When he went to Athens, he went with Silas and Timothy. Uh, let's just read Acts chapter 17 from verse 10. And this is important because this gives us a sense of history as to the movement of the Apostle Paul and how he was then able to send Timothy to help them. So Acts 17, 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. So that's when he had to run again for his life from Thessalonica to Berea who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily, whether what Paul and they were saying was really so. 
Therefore, many of them believe also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. So in Berea, he actually got a very strong Gentile following and not just, um, as we would say, ordinary people, but he was able to relate to the aristocracy. When it says here, honorable women, they were women of prestige, women who were at a certain level and a certain class in society, he was able to reach them. Verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people, all right? So these Jews, the yeah, Jews from Philippi, went into Thessalonica. Then you have those from Thessalonica now going into Berea to bring suffering and persecution to the apostle and his team. Verse 14, and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timothy aboard there still. So Paul had to once again run for his life. This time he had to go by way of the sea. And so in doing that, Timothy and Silas remained in Berea. And it was only a matter of time that the Apostle Paul sent instruction for Timothy to go back to Thessalonica and help to strengthen the believers there. Look at verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So here he arrives in Athens. He is looking forward that they would come to him. But at some point he is going to send Timothy back. So if we were to look at verses one and two, we will get a little more clarity now as to the history of what's happening. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timothy as our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. And you know what, what comes out in the early part of this chapter here is that the apostle Paul really had these people in his heart. So he says here, by the time we got to Athens, I couldn't take it any longer. You know, if we were to put it in Trini term, Paul had a real tabanka for the Thessalonians. He said, when I couldn't forbear, I couldn't take it anymore. He said, I had no choice but to send Timothy because Begin to imagine this church has just started in three weeks time. He knew that he left some believers there. He, he knew that he had only been there a short time. He went to Berea, but he couldn't stay there. Now he has to cross the sea. He goes to Athens, but these people are on Paul's heart. And he said, when I couldn't forbear, in other words, I couldn't take the pressure of your absence anymore. So I said, Timothy, Go back to Thessalonica. See what is going on there. Strengthen them. Do whatever you could to make sure that these people stand strong. And so he said, I sent Timothy. And we want to take a minute uh, to look at uh, this Timothy that he sent to them. So he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. And what we will observe here, um, in terms of the heart of the apostle, we would have seen it before, but I, I never did mention it in this way. We would realize that as the founder of the church in Thessalonica, the apostle Paul, in terms of ministry and gifting, he was an evangelist because he moved from city to city to city. But as much as he was an evangelist giving birth to churches, he was also a pastor. He had a pastor's heart. And, you know, that is so important because sometimes, you know, if you only have the heart of evangelists, you just make a whole lot of babies. But at the end of the day, who's going to take care of these babies? And so because the Apostle Paul had a pastor's heart, he was concerned with regard to what's going to happen to them. How are they going to grow? I don't want to abort them. And so because of the pastor's heart, he is definitely going to send Timothy to them. I want us to look at a word right there in verse 1. And that is the Greek word left. 
okay? The word left. The Greek here for left is a strong meaning and it means bereaved, bereaved. And so when you look at it, he said, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. In other words, he said, listen, I feel as though you all have just departed from me. I feel as though I have lost loved ones. I feel bereaved. And because of this feeling of bereavement, he said, the feeling is that, listen, just I will stay here, but Timothy, you go and you see what is happening. And so as we look at Timothy, we will see the kind of character of man that the Apostle Paul had put his trust in. First of all, he sent Timothy our brother, okay? So our brother here, of course, Adelphos, coming out of the same womb. Timothy was very, very close to his heart as we continue to read the Gospels and the epistles. Not the Gospels, but the epistles and the letters. We would realize um, Timothy was like the Apostle Paul's spiritual son. And so here he refers to him as a brother. But also, even though he was like a brother and like a son to him, he gave him the respect as to the man of God that he was. He said, a minister of God. And that minister comes from that Greek word doulos, which means servant or slave. And he is saying, the, the, the man that I sent to you, he was indeed a servant of the Lord. And he goes on to say, not only a servant of the Lord, but he was a fellow laborer, a fellow laborer. And what you see here is that the Apostle Paul at no time put Timothy anywhere on that spectrum less than he was. He saw him as a brother. He saw him as a minister. He saw him as a fellow laborer. As much as he was his spiritual father, he gave credit to Timothy for the work that God had done in his life. In some other letters we will read, 1 Corinthians 16 and 10. Now, if Timothy come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh for the Lord as I also do. And here again, he's sending a letter to the Corinthians and he's saying to them, I'm going to send Timothy to you, but do not intimidate him. Do not make him feel that he is less than. Why? Because he is a worker of the Lord, just as how I am. Look at verse 11. He say, let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him for in peace that he may come unto me for I look for him with the brethren all right so it, it tells us also what we can learn from that especially those of us who are more senior in the gospel that as God will allow us to bring people up in ministry, you know, we have our protégés, as they will say, you know, and, and, and people who are emulating us, as we were talking earlier, follow me as I follow Christ. As the Lord begins to raise these people up, let us not see them as less than, but there comes a point in time where we have to recognize that they are ministers. We have to recognize that they are fellow laborers with us. And let us not be intimidated by the next generation that's coming up. Because, you know, it's like when Jesus said, he said, greater works than these shall ye do. And what Jesus was saying is, listen, I was limited here and I could have only done so much, but I have prepared you to do more than I could have ever done. And I say to us leaders, one of the great things about leadership leadership is not being afraid for the younger person to come up, but to be so blessed that you could have had a part in that person's life to bring them to the level where you are at. And even more than that, they can do more and they can go further and they can reach where you may never have been able to reach. So let's appreciate the ministers that God would raise under us. And as God raises them, 
them up. Let us not be fearful of them. Let us not be intimidated by them. But let us understand that this is what it's all about. We train them so that they can rise up and meet their generation and do greater works than we could have ever done. And so look at Philippians 2 and 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy as shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. And what that shows us with re respect to, to, to Paul and Timothy is that Paul had come to a place where he had full confidence in Timothy. He said, I have worked with a lot of folks. Uh, I have a team of many. He said, but I don't know no man that is as like-minded as I am. And this is the man that I'm releasing to you. He said, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul has had some experience with some fellow workers and fellow laborers. And I remember the one that comes to my head right now was one that was called Demas that had worked with him and labored with him. And then there came a point where Demas went back and he backslid. So the apostle Paul knew what it was to work with people and train people. And at the end of the day, he could not trust them. But here he was able to trust Timothy. He said in verse 22, Philippians 2, but you know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he had served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. So again here, we see Timothy. He was sending Timothy all over the place. Wherever there was a gap to fill, somehow Timothy was the man to fill that gap. Because we see him speaking of Timothy in 1 Corinthians. Now we come to Philippians and he's saying, listen, as soon as I could spare Timothy, I'm going to send him to you. So it tells us also that even at the loss of his own comfort, Comfort that Timothy could have given to him. He was willing to suffer the loss of Timothy in his own presence to send Timothy to the various churches where people can trust us that, you know, when there is a need here, they can say, you go there, you go there, you stop the gap here, you fell in here. I mean, that is awesome. And that tells us the kind of confidence. So Timothy was a brother. Timothy was a son. He was like a father. He was a, a fellow lay and, and we want to really thank God for Timothy. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are what? We are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. We are God's building. So Timothy was not just there, you know, taking life light, but he was a hard worker. And that was the kind of man the apostle Paul was glad to have. But when the time came, he was also willing to release him. So let's move on here now. Verse um, three, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourself know that we are appointed thereunto. So the Apostle Paul is encouraging me. Listen, I want you to stand, but I want you to know in the process of serving the Lord, Persecution, suffering, challenges, afflictions, we are appointed to those things. So even sometimes when you're treating with new believers, young believers, don't let them feel that Christianity is a pie in the sky. Let them know from early o'clock you're going to face challenges. You're going to face afflictions. You are going to face sufferings. It comes part and parcel with the Christian work. We are appointed. And so sufferings and afflictions and trials, those things do not come our way for us to run away, but to make us indeed stronger. 
Let's read Philippians 1.29. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And look at 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Think it not strange. In other words, when persecutions come our way, when trials and hardships come our way, let's not get in a corner and say, why me, Lord? Why me? Why? Look, everybody doing all right. Why I have to be going through all of this? And you know as well as I do that some of us, we get it more than others. But you know what? God is doing something different in each of our lives. My future is not your future and your future is not your sister's future or your brother's future and because of the expected end that god has for us we are not going to face the same challenges we are not going to have the same persecutions and afflictions each of us will have our own trials and our own testings because god is taking us into our own place where he wants to work in us and through us and to show forth his glory in us all right so he says here to them do not be moved do do not let the trials that are in cause you to come out of the way or out of the path he says because we were appointed there unto look at verse four for verily when we were with you we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And you know, you know this, you know that we come across all the time. And what you see here in that short space of time, probably before the, um, what we call them, the persecutors arrived from Philippi to Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul is aware of what's going on. He knows they're going to come for him. He knows that these new believers are going to pay. So early, early, early o'clock, he says, listen, you're going to trouble, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have to, he said, and you know, we taught you, we told you it will come. So when it comes, do not be moved by it because we taught you that it is part and parcel of the Christian life. And that's important because I tell you, you know, even as I share, I'm reminded of my own experience as a young believer. And you know, I remember when I came to Christ and I was new, 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 a new babe. Everything I wanted, I used to get. Jesus used to just meet every knee. He just used to do everything for me. And I used to say, wow, it's so awesome to be a Christian. I mean, I could hardly say the words. And the Lord provided and he opened doors and he made a way. And I was just seeing miracle after him. And then all of a sudden, pressure pressure. I start getting all kinds of trials. I cannot begin to explain to you the kind of trials that I faced after a couple of months in my Christianity. And nobody had really prepared me for it because I remember the days when I felt, does it make sense here? But for the grace of God, I never thought of going back. I stood my ground. But during those times, what I can say, I had some strong believers who when they would hear what was going on with me, they would come by and they would provide that kind of strength. But nobody told me that in advance. So that now that we know, it's important that we let the believers know. And if you're a young believer out there, listen to what I'm saying. Right now, you're the baby. So you're being milked, you're getting everything, all your needs are being met. But soon and very soon, the trials are going to begin to come. And this is where the rubber is going to meet the road. But hear what? You stand strong. You let the trials come. Let the persecutions come. You were appointed unto it. And because you were appointed unto it, there is a grace that God is going to give you that you will be able to stand in it and you will come out victorious. Here I am, 50 years later, 
as fresh as yesterday my experience with Jesus Christ and not for me only but for all those of you out there who have walked the walk who have talked the talk and today you can lift your hands and say praise be to God I am still standing verse 5 for this cause when I could no longer forbear I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and you labor in vain. So what he does here, he, he, he speaks about persecutions, but then he goes on to show to them where the source is. The source is the devil himself. He is the tempter. And remember when we did James, we said the temptations and testings, one and the same word. So the enemy will come to tempt us to do wrong and he will also come to test us, to weary us so that we can give up. And so he says to them, I send to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you. He said, I sent to find out what's going on with you. Are you still keeping the faith? Because the devil is very real. And I want to say to us this evening, the devil will always be on our heels. Always be alert because as testing and trials come, the enemy is the one who will be putting the obstacles in our path. But you see, Jesus, who's already run the race, he's on the other side. He's seeing us having to cross the hurdles, having to go under, take a dip sometimes, come up sometimes. But he's there cheering us on and letting us know that we could make it. So to every um, obstacle that the enemy would put in your way, Jesus is going to allow you to conquer it. And so he would come in various ways. What is his aim? His aim is to devour you. His aim is to kill you. His aim is to steal from you. His ultimate aim is to destroy you. But God is indeed going to give us the victory. And I want to take a minute here to just look at that word faith. It's a key word in the chapter because what we will observe is that he uses the word quite often. Why? Because he wants them to stand strong in the faith that had been passed on to them. So let's look for a moment at verse two, backing up a bit. He says at the end of the verse, and to comfort you concerning your faith. So first of all, he says here to them, I am sending this word to you to bring comfort to you. I am sending Timothy to comfort your faith so that in other words even while you your faith is being tested and tried you will have a comfort because I have sent someone to you and then now he was going to send a word to them to comfort their faith look at verse 5 he says here I sent to know your faith in other words I sent Timothy to inquire are they still keeping faith where is the level of their faith? What the, was the temperature of their faith? The Apostle Paul was concerned. Look at verse 6. We'll just flip there and come back a bit. He says, and brought us good tidings of your faith. And so he said, I sent to find out what was going on. But here what? Timothy sent good tidings for us that your faith was indeed standing strong. Look at verse 7. We were comforted over you in all of our affliction and distress by your faith. So what we see the Apostle Paul here sent to comfort them in their faith and then he is saying to them just the fact that we heard that you are standing strong you have now comforted our faith hallelujah and verse 10 in this chapter he says night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith so he said we know that your faith is not yet perfect. So we send Timothy to continue to teach you, to continue to build you 
in the areas where you may be lacking. And actually this letter that he is writing is to be able to strengthen them as well in areas where they may be lacking. So all in all, the Apostle Paul is seeking to build the faith of the persons or the believers in Thessalonica. So let's move on here now. I want to, before I move though, I want to read a verse from Acts chapter 18 and verse five. And it reads here, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And this verse is saying to us that there came a point in time when Timothy had to leave and also Silas had to leave and return to give Paul some support over in Athens. So while they would have been in Macedonia, uh, Silas was at another church, not where Timothy was, while Silas, Silas was doing what Paul had asked him to, him to do, and Timothy was doing what Paul had asked him to do. The time had come that they both had to leave the area of Macedonia and return to give Paul a hand. So let's look at verses 6 to 8 now. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. So this second segment has to do with not just the fact that he sent Timothy, but the fact that he writes a letter to them. And in writing the letter, he says to them, he says, listen, Timothy brought back good news for us. And Timothy said to us that not only is your faith standing, but your love is also strong. And not only that, you all are missing us as much as we are missing you. And that was such a joy to the apostle to know that even though he had spent such a short space of time, he was very dear to this band of believers and rightfully so. We can understand that because he had brought them into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so he says here that you have good remembrance of us always. So whatever they had to say concerning the apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were remembering them in a very good way. And he goes on to say that you were desiring us as much as we were also desiring you. Thank you, Lord. Moving along, verse uh, uh, seven. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So he said, when we heard that you were doing well, and I'll tell you something, eh? there's nothing to bless you more than when you would have had the opportunity to bring somebody to Christ, to lead somebody to Christ, to have the opportunity to disciple somebody in Christ and to see them grow. There is nothing more heartwarming this side of earth. And this is what is going on here. The Apostle Paul is so comforted to know that even though there was some kind of abandonment, as we would say, yet still these people hold held on to the word that had been given to them. They held on to the love that had been dispensed to them. And they were believing in the apostles. And the apostles were strengthened when they recognized that these people were growing. They were growing. And as I said before, it's great joy when as we dispense this gospel, we see growth. We are blessed. We are encouraged as we see people change, as we see them move from one space that they might have been in to another place, a place of victory. And in verse 8, he says, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now we live. How powerful. It's almost as though the Apostle Paul is saying, not knowing what was going on with you, we were becoming weak as though we were going to die. 
but just hearing that you are doing well, our lives have been quickened. The Zoe life has once again come alive in our hearts and we are quickened and we are alive again because we have been hearing such good news. And so let's move on to this other segment here. I want to read a passage of scripture that is important as it relates to the local church and growth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And it says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, that we henceforth be no more like children tossed to and fro, carried away by every wind, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up thereby in all things for whom the whole body fitly joined and compacted by that which every joint supply according to the effectual working in the measure of every part and you see what the apostle paul is bringing out here is the work of the church and i want to stop long enough to say this we have a responsibility as a church I want to take our minds away just for a few moments from the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silas and the church at Thessalonica because it seems that everything was just falling in line. And the Apostle Paul, with all that he had departed, not departed, but imparted to these men, these men were now strengthening the churches the churches were becoming stronger and they were now being a blessing to him. And I want to say to us that the church of Jesus Christ, we have a simple, simple mandate. And that mandate is once we are saved, we have a responsibility to build up each other, to strengthen each other. Our job is not to pull down and to destroy, that is not the work of the church. The work of the church is to build up. When last did we pick up the telephone and speak into the air of a sister or a brother, words of comfort, words that will build them up, not words that will destroy them and hurt them. When last, I mean, we are, in a COVID situation now. So we are not able to go to the homes or go to the doors or say, come over by me. We are not in that kind of environment, but we have the phone. We can pick it up. We can give a call. We can send a scripture because our responsibility is to make sure that even despite what is happening in this COVID, we have to keep each other together. We have to build each other up. We don't know what people are experiencing behind their walls. We don't know when a sister is hurting or crying, when a brother is in deep pain. We don't know what's going on. But a call can make a difference, a word of comfort, a word of encouragement. And so I encourage us this evening, let's take some time to build each other up. This is the purpose of the church, to edify one another. As the Apostle Paul says here, Jesus gave some apostles, he gave some evangelists, he gave some pastors, he gave some teachers. He has every limb, he said, every limb is supplying, every limb, the arm is supplying to the hand, the fingers supplying to the rest of the body. Come on, it's one body, we are one unit, every joint is supplying. And this is what the church is all about. Let's learn to build up, to encourage, 
to strengthen. Let's not also take each other for granted and think that everything is all right. You may not be able to touch everybody, but you can touch somebody. You can build up somebody. All right. So let's go to the last section. And the last section is that he now prays for them. And that is covered from verse 9 all the way to verse 13. So the word of God and prayer comes together. So he's giving them the word, but he's going to unite it with prayer. I want to quote a verse before I even read from here. First Samuel 12 and verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear Peter, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what we see here is that the word and prayer, they go hand in hand. So here he was giving them the word by writing this letter. And now he's adding that final ingredient to top it all off, the ingredient of prayer. Verse 9, for what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. And he's saying, we are so overjoyed that we do not even have the words. We do not have adequate words to express to God the joy that we feel when we hear how well you are doing. When you hear sometime how well a brother is doing or how well a sister is doing, does it bring joy to our hearts? That's a good question. Because sometimes as believers, when we hear how well others are doing, we jealous, we envy, we say bad things, we gossip about them. This is a different picture we are seeing here. That when he heard how well they were doing, he did not have the words to thank God for them. When last did we say, thank you, Lord for this brother or this sister whom you have blessed. You've given them a promotion. You've provided them with a house. They are no longer renting. They own their own home. Or oh, you've blessed them with a baby after all these years. That's the kind of body we should be a part of. He says in verse 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So the Apostle Paul said, we want to perfect your faith. We want to perfect it because we know that there is lack. He said, but how do you think we plan to perfect it? We are going to perfect it when we see you when we see you. So I trust that every child of God on this platform, you are not satisfied with the virtual platform. I should not be satisfied with this virtual platform. We long after each other. We long to see each other face to face. And I say face to face because when next we see each other, we may still have on the masks. But ever so often we might be able to do that smile and put it back on. There is something about seeing people face to face. And the Apostle Paul said, we know when we see you face to face that your faith will indeed be perfected. Then he says, now God himself and our father and the Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. So he appeals here to the father, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his prayer for them is that God will direct each and every one of them. He said, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. And he says, the quality of love we have for you, we want to pass that quality on to you so that when you get that quality of love, you will be able to love each other, but not just love each other, love all men. 
all men. He say, abound in love one towards another and towards all men. So we cannot be satisfied to just love the people in the church. We have to love all men. We have to have a passion for all men. We have to want and have the desire to reach all men with the love that Christ has given to us. And then as we come to verse uh, 13, and before, before we go to 13, I want to just pull out those two words. You know, he says, the Lord make you to increase and abound. So whatever level you have, that God will allow it to grow more and more, to increase. And you see, to increase is to just get more, but to abound is to overflow. And so the love that we have, we want it to overflow in you. And when it overflows in you, it's going to overflow to each and every one. And then finally in verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So again, as we close, he said that at the end, when it is all over, you will be established. You will be without blame, without spot, without blemish. You will be holy before God, the Father, and what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here again, he speaks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember when we did chapter 2, the last verse says, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Look at the last verse in chapter 1. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So at the end of every chapter, he speaks about the second coming of Christ. But when we come into chapter four, he's going to blow it wide open. And then I'm going to take all those scriptures, bring it together, give it a sense of order as the apostle Paul speaks about the coming of the Lord. And as we close this evening, I want to remind you that Jesus is coming soon. Let's be ready. Let's live godly lives. Maranatha. God bless you. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We pray that your word will continue to find root in our hearts and we will grow from strength to strength, cause us to be a blessing to the body and most of all, Lord, to be a blessing to all those who belong to your kingdom, but they are not yet in, that we will bring them in with the love of Jesus Christ spread abroad in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a good evening.